Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Chris Jenkins. Um, oh, no. Oh, hang on. Ah! Already going well. I'm not this Jenkins. We are related, but um, we fell out at a wedding and we don't talk anymore. I am this Chris Jenkins. I work for Confluent um, as a developer advocate. And at Confluent, we concern ourselves with Apache Kafka. And Kafka is an interesting beast. It sort of looks like a lot of different things at once. Um, it looks a bit like a database. It's not a database, but it kind of is. You can store data in it. You can query data out. So I guess it is a place to base your data. It looks a bit like a queue, but it's not a queue because it's persistent. Anything you put in it stays around forever. I guess it looks like a big old list. Um, and if there are any Lisp programmers in the room, they'll tell you that you can use a list to do just about anything. Um, it also looks a bit like a state machine. It wears many hats. But the way I think about it is this. If you think about how relational databases started doing replication a while ago, right? For a while, they tried to solve the problem of replication by replicating disk blocks. And it didn't work very well. And they all abandoned that approach and have pretty much unified on this. Whenever you get a change to your database, write it to a file. Just stick it on a file, append it at the end, and build up this big log of changes to the database, and then just ship them off. Log files are great. They're cheap to write to, because you only ever append to the end. They are cheap to replicate, because they never change. They grow, but they never change. So you can just send them around the system very freely. And, um, and we know from looking at relational databases that if you have a log of all the different events that went into your system, you can build back up to an entire database. That's how database replication works in these systems. I'll send you what happened. You think about it in the same way I thought about it, and we'll end up in the same place. And the way I think about Kafka is if logs are so great, if you can take a log and you can easily replicate it, you can easily distribute it, you can also shard it quite nicely. And that's enough to build up an entire database system. Then what if instead we started with the log at the heart of our system and built up from that? Instead of starting at the state machine, which is processing the log, start with the log, make replication easy. We know we can get back to a database from this architecture. So let's try that. How does it play out? That's the big question of this talk. How does that play out? Um, you know, this clicker does not quite work. Um, you know, it ra and doing that raises a lot of interesting questions, right? So it raises the question of, firstly, do we need to build an entire state machine that's as complex as a relational database? If we're shipping logs around, do we need all that power? Would we make different choices? Do we need one log? Could we split the log into different streams of work? Would that have advantages? Um, would we build simpler state machines than an entire relational database? Would we, would we build micro state machines that had very specific purposes, or would we go generic? Lots of interesting questions that raises, and they're all very abstract. So if you learn anything like I do, abstract questions are interesting and great, but I find I don't actually learn until I start to get my hands dirty. I like to build things and then step back and look at the thing I've built and say, am I happy? Is this good? Is what I've built simple or complex? Was it easy to build? Was it hard to build just because I had to learn? Or is it fundamentally hard? I like asking those questions once I've got some code in my hands. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at some built code. Um, it would be nice if I could get you all to code your own thing from scratch this afternoon. But we'll do the condensed version, where I've built it and we talk it through. 
And I wondered, what should I build to talk to you about this? Um, I could build a Java pet store, and I'd probably clear out half the room. I could build a to-do list app. I think we've all seen our fill of those as well. Um, and I hit upon an old idea, something I built ages ago, which is a text adventure game, which is a classic old school system. Um, hands up, who remembers text adventure games? OK, a decent number of you. For, for the people who missed that, by one reason or another, they kind of survived today. They've fallen out of fashion, but they're still around. It, these days, you'll see them as narrative adventure games, where, oh, god, I'm not having great times with this clicker. There we go. Where uh, there's a story, the story progresses, at certain points you make choices, and the story goes in a different direction. Before that, historically, we have point and click games like Monkey Island, which is a classic. Um, and the whole game progresses by you wander around, you collect things, not quite knowing what you're going to do with them. Eventually, you get somewhere where you can use that item to do something else, to change the world, and you're moving around, trying to gradually get the story to evolve to its conclusion. If you go even further back, you get things like this, where they are literally, nearly literally, text adventure games, where it's just words and you giving commands. And it turns out this is actually a really nice hack if ever you want to exercise a new programming language or a new system. You can do away with most things except a prompt and some processing. So I built one of those. Let me give you a quick demo. There we go. So um, this is a simulated green screen from the old days. And you begin in a room. And it says, you're standing on stage at DevOx. This feels very true. In the middle of the room stands a giant computer spitting out data. Not quite so true. The data looks important, but you do not know why. Mystery. You can see data and a lanyard. What can we do in this game? Um, unknown command, um, try asking for help. We can ask for help. OK, the available commands in this game, you can go north, south, west, east. You can pick up items. You can use items. You can check which items you've got. And you can ask for help. OK, let's, uh, let's play around a little. So let's pick up that data. Good. While we're here, I'll pick up that lanyard. Anyone? In, I don't know what these are called in Polish. Incidentally, I don't know if everyone's noticed this, but these lanyards are also USB cables. And I think that's brilliant. Hat tip to the uh, organizers. It's the first time I've had a lanyard I won't throw away. Um, Unless, of course, HSBC is spying on the data that goes through it. Call me paranoid. Um, I will pick up that lanyard. Uh, let's just check what I have. Your knapsack contains data and a lanyard. OK. Well, the title of the talk is Pick Up Data, Go North. So I'm going to go north. You're standing in the main hallway. It's bustling with life and coffee. What can I do? I will use magic. You do not have that item to use. OK, I'll use data. You cannot use that item here. Last try, I will use the lanyard. You wave your lanyard in the air like a fool. Someone in the distance shouts, hey, that looks like fun. And pretty soon, you started a flash mob of lanyard wavers. You dance for hours, and then the party subsides. As the mob leaves, one dancer drops his conference t-shirt. You pick it up. And now we find our inventory contains data and a t-shirt, and the adventure continues. That's all I'm going to show you of the game, but you get the idea. This is an interactive, real-time adventure. It's got state. It's got um, maps. It's got all the kind of structure we like to play with. So let's see how that's built. At its heart, it's a CQRS system, right? I have put together a client and a web server, and it's very simple and very dull. 
you send some text to the web server, it sticks it on one of these logs called commands, and then forgets about it. And somewhere else in the system, actually in a separate Java process, we're going to look for new things added to that stream of commands, do some stuff, and send back responses. And the web server will dumbly wait for those and send them off to the client. So the question becomes, what's in that box mark do stuff? Um, and I'm going to give you a code warning here. There is a lot of code in this talk. Um, and I appreciate it's day three on Friday afternoon of a conference. Everyone's staring down the barrel of the weekend. And it's in Java, so some people, that may be even a little more than you can handle, don't worry about the code. I put the code in so you can get a feel for the shape of it. And so the people watching on YouTube can pause it at their leisure. But don't worry so much about the individual bits of syntax, but the overall shape of how this solution works. We're asking the question, if we thought about problems as a stream of events, how would we solve it? What shape does it take? So we start with two simple streams. The first one is commands. I'll just show you the syntax of how you create the stream. Command is very simple. It has a user ID, which is just a random UUID, and the command string, just the raw string. And then on the other side, we have a response, almost identical. It's got the user ID. It's got a response string. I decided to add in a source, because it's quite useful for debugging, to track which part of our system this response came from. But it's essentially just passing strings back and forth, keyed by user. So what's the simplest possible thing we could do next? Um, well, anyone who's ever written a server has probably done this at some stage. The simplest thing we can do is um, an echo server, right? We can just take what they've said and say, hey, I heard you said that. What does that look like? In Java code, and again, don't get too bogged down, we have this thing that lets us build stream processes in Kafka. And we say which stream we'd like to process. So that's the command string. And we give it some information about how we deserialize it. That can get a bit heavy, so I'm going to start um, leaving the details of serialization out so we can just look at the shape. So feel free to read it like this. We build a stream from the commands, and there's some serialization stuff. OK, so now we've got a stream of commands coming in. What do we do with that? Well, we, uh, we map over that stream which is just every time you get a new event, a new function, a new, a new piece of data, run a function on it, and send out the, re the uh, result. We run over that command, append echo to the front, and send it to the stream of responses. It's that simple. Commands come in. We deal with them one at a time. We spit them out. OK, so that, that much proves that the system is working. We need to do something more advanced. So the first really interesting primitive in processing streams that we need is, um, is a way of splitting the streams and saying, we've got this long stream of data. There are certain pieces I'm interested in. Someone else can worry about the others. So um, you will get bonus points in your job interview if you immediately say, this is the chain of responsibility pattern. That gets you two interview bonus points. Um, Kafka, uh, in a library called Kafka Streams, has the way to do this. We just spit the stream up, and now we're going to think about the individual commands we might get in, in groups. Uh, and the way the API looks is you get the key, you get the value, and you tell it if you're interested by returning a Boolean. So it's a predicate. And then if you are interested, you get that substream of data, and you can do stuff with it. So. In our case, we're going to get user ID and command and process those. So the first real command we can implement um, is help. That's really easy. We look at the values that are coming in, and if the command is help, we'll just construct a big old string of help and spit it out to the user. Yeah? There's a, a, 
There's a lot of characters in there, because Java, it is verbose. You know, the, we can't get away from that. But it's simple what's happening here. Commands come in. We say, I'm interested in these kinds. I'll transform them and send them out. A nice feature of this API is we also have uh, a fallback handler, a way of saying, if nothing matches, we can do something. And that's how I've implemented the unknown command erm bit you saw at the start. Right? So with that in place, we have help. We have unknown commands. All we need to do now is insert the different handlers to deal with the other commands. We might end up with a game. What's the first handler? Uh, let's deal with movement, OK? So there are four movement commands. And we can just say, we could just construct a, um, a static list of the movement commands. And if it's one of those, we're interested. We return true. And then we just have to deal with that. We could deal with it here and now, but I'm not going to. I'm instead going to pass that onto a separate log file, a separate stream. So I'm not actually worrying about processing movement commands so much as identifying them, sending them on for someone else to worry about. We've opened the door to um, separating out into microservices. But that's sort of an aside. Let's try the other commands in a slightly different way. So there's a group of item usage commands. And again, we're not going to process them immediately. We're just going to identify them. So I could do it this way. I could build a parser that does some basic string processing and says, OK, I'm interested in these commands. Send those on. Yeah, sorry, identify those. And the thing that's different here is instead of just identifying the strings and passing them on, we're starting to think about parsing them, turning them into richer data structures before we pass them on. So that ends up looking like our predicate is, can we parse it? And our work is, if we can, take the thing we parsed and pass that onto a different stream and then forget about it. Right. So we end up with this as our first block of processing. Some commands get moved onto the movement stream for dealing with. Some commands get enriched with little structure and moved onto an inventory stream. And some are so simple we can deal with right now. So the next thing to do is think about how those movements would actually be uh, processed. And how do we process them? Well, it would be nice if we could turn this stream of movements into an actual place where every user is. We'd like to track not how you've moved, but where you ended up. We're going to need that. And that's where we see the first table come back in. We start clawing back up not clawing back up, we start sidling along to uh, tables and some ideas we're familiar with in relational data. How is that coded? Well, the first thing we've got to do is parse the commands. We kind of um, skipped that in the last stage. So we'll just turn each command about position into an actual change of position. Right? Very simple piece. And then um, we, we could almost assume that it's right, correct by now, and they will all be, um, all be movement commands. But we, because of Java syntax, we need to filter out the ones that didn't match. That will be handled elsewhere. And then, OK, so now we've got a stream of user ID and delta. And we can group that up into a table um, grouped by the user. And we need some way of reducing all the user's position changes by delta into a single position. Uh, it's fairly simple. It's fairly simple to add two positions together. So we reduce it. Um, if you're familiar with like Java 8 streams, this is probably looking very familiar. Um, or if you're familiar with most functional programming languages. So that gives us a table of each user and their position. What should we do with that? The first thing we could do is tell the user. Every table in Kafka is also a stream. It's a stream of the changes to that table. It's very easy to start 
even though we've made a table, it's very easy to start thinking in terms of new events being transformed into other new events. So we get this. We just say to the user, you move to position blah. But that's not terribly interesting. Someone says, go north, and it says, you've now moved to these coordinates. So we need something a bit more rich. We need to model the locations in the game. We need to build out a map to have an actual game. So how will we store our map data? We could store it statically in code, but that's not really making a game engine. So we should store it as data somewhere. It won't surprise you to hear that I'm proposing we store that as a read-only log that always appends with stuff, because it's the basic building block we've got. So let's define a new stream of data. X and Y are the key. That's what makes a place unique. We'll give it description. We'll give it some objects you can find in that place. And then we just insert data. And we'd like to get to the point where we take the user's current position and all the different positions we know about, join them together, and get this enriched piece of data, which isn't just the user's position, but is also what it means in a larger context. So the first thing to do is take that stream of um, location descriptions and roll it up into a table. And slight aside here, so there are two main tables you can concern yourself with in Kafka. There's a regular table, which has some interesting partitioning properties that we won't get stuck into. But you can, ba you can basically say a regular table will only be accessed by certain keys other servers may have access to different keys. We don't want that here. What we need is the table that will always have all the data in. So as a detail, you want a global table that contains the entire set of data. And in this case, that's absolutely fine. We won't have that much data to store in memory, because there are only a few locations. So we have a table of the user's position. We have a table of what's at each position. It's time to join them together. And a join looks like this. We take the user's position table, turn it into a stream of changes, left join, because there's no guarantee that where the user goes, there will be a place to go. And a left join takes three arguments in this case. What do you want to join to? What from the first table defines the key for joining to the second table? And then once you've got those two values, what do you do with them? And our answer is, we just smush them together into a new data structure. Now we've got that. We have a rich feed of where the user is in the world. So we probably already know what to do with that. We've got a stream of interesting changes to the user's data. Time to tell the user. So we just stream that off to the response table, uh, response stream. But we can also do something else with it. We can deal with this stream in another way. As well as sending it to the user, we can also say, that's kind of interesting data to have on hand, a stream of where the user is and the description. So let's turn that back into a table. It's absolutely fine to do both. We can treat, in many cases, we can treat streams like tables and tables like streams. So um, this one we group by key because we're grouping by the user ID. That's, what, that's our discerning parameter. And then how do we reduce a series of changes to the user's location? Just take the newer one. The old one we can forget about for now. That's a lot of code. So where are we? We have live streaming data for our real-time interactive game. We have the concept of fanning out different commands and handling them in separate systems or subsystems. We have the concept of maybe enriching that data, not at all, a little bit, a lot, before we pass it on. We have ways to join data together. We have the concept of standing data, like configuration for the whole system. So at the moment, you can go through the game and look around. The next piece we need to do is inventory. Uh, picking up things, seeing what things you have, 
using the things you've picked up. And if we can get that done, we finish making the game engine. So let's take those in turn. Picking things up. We've got a stream of commands that say pick up an X. We have this rich description of where someone is and what's there. We need to join those and either say, yeah, that thing you want to pick up is here, so you can have it, or, excuse me, or it's not here, You've, so no. As code, is everyone enjoying the Java code on a Friday afternoon? I bet, you, yes, there's at least one masochist in the audience, thank you. <laughs> so, um, just to, again, just to give you the shape of it, right? We take this stream of um, inventory commands, and we say, for now, just filter for the ones that involve picking stuff up. Join that with our ta rich table of the user's location. And Java dance to say, is this thing available? And we could process a bit more there, but let's hand it off. Let's just say the user has asked to pick something up, and it is or isn't available. And we'll process that in a second. So. We have a list of the user is trying to pick up an X and they can, or the user is trying to pick up an X and they can't. Let's split on that and process it. Our predicate is, can they? If they can, we'll stream that off to another log. I love logs. No end of them. You can have as many as you like. They're cheap. We'll stream that off to an inventory log, which is kind of a record of what they actually held. And we're going to have to add in a parameter that says they're holding it or they're not. And I'll explain why in a minute. But we just pass this structure of data held. Or the thing's not available. We have a failure case with the default branch and say, you can't do that. Forget about it. Next thing we need to do is let the user know that that's happened. This should look very familiar by this stage of the talk. We're going to filter for things they're actually holding and say, you picked it up. Well done, you. Good times. OK? So that's that piece. And again, it's mostly built out of lists, processing, and filtering. How do we get to our inventory? Well, let's build a new table of the user and what they hold by looking at that inventory table grouping it by the user, and aggregating that up. This is almost exactly the same as a reduce. Right? Uh, the main difference being in the reduce we saw earlier, we had two positions that produced a position. Category theorists will call this a monoid. I promised myself I wouldn't invoke category theory in this talk, but I did it anyway. Um, and this, but in this case, we don't. We have two items, and we want to return an array. So we start, we initialize an empty array, and then we've got a way of adding new things into that array with a reducing function. The reducing function looks like this. There is a bit of a terrible dance with Java objects, but it's basically saying if the user has held, if we say the user has picked the object up, then add it to the knapsack. If the user has said, if the system has said we, the user has put it down or lost it somehow, then we take it out of the array. That's going to become important in just a second. And then we can actually process the inventory command. Right? We can say whenever we see a command with uh, the action inventory, we can join to that table we've just created and send the list back to the user. So there's one more piece to build before we finally have a game. We can stand back and look at our mighty works. <laughs> and that's to say, how do items work? What are the rules in the game for items? Let's build another stream, which is a stream of rules. Again, sort of standing data, part of the game engine's configuration. And an item rule will have which item we're dealing with. There'll be one rule per item, I've decided, in this kind of game engine. Each item has a place you can use it. Each item has a description that happens when you use it, so like the lanyard party. And each item, when you use it, gives you a new item so that the adventure could continue. We stick some example standing data in there. 
You take a drink, you're left with an empty glass. That's how these games work. And we can turn that into a table in exactly the same way we turned the location data into a table. So, last piece, and it's all built out of things we've already seen. We look for the user saying, use an X. We join that with the things they have. We join that with where they are. And we join that with the rules about the thing they want to use. And process that in different ways, depending on what that join returns. So here's the join. Uh, sorry, here's the filter for using. The join to what they have. The join to where they are and what's going on there. And the join to the rules for the item. And now we have this rich data structure that says all that. Where you are, what you have, what you want to use, and the rules for using it. So that should be enough to do the last bit of processing to make the game. Let's split that again and deal with it separately. Um, if the item's not available, if it's not in their knapsack, we have to tell them that you, um, you don't have the item to use. Can't happen. We stream that off to the responses. If there's no rule for this item, or if they're not in the right location for the item, then we say you can't use the item here. We could separate that out into saying that item has no use, but that would be a bit weird. Let's leave them guessing. And then, if we've passed all those cases, we can actually start to worry about them getting the, uh, losing the old item and getting the new one. So the default branch is this. And let's unpack this a bit, because it introduces a couple of extra ideas. So. How in an immutable log, which can never change, how do you deal with, it's easy to understand how you deal with taking on a new item, how do you deal with getting rid of an item? And that's what that true false flag is about. It's about saying, a, instead of saying delete the item, it's saying add in the fact that they no longer have it. Subtle difference, but it's how, how you build things up in these systems. Okay. So, that's the first piece. The second piece this introduces is there's no reason when you're processing a stream why you have to return exactly one thing. You can split it out into multiple things, or you can return nothing. And that's where this um, flat map values command comes in. Right? You can say, I might return nothing, I might return many things. To give you an example, um, I've got a flight going from here back to London. I've got a booking going from here to London. It's actually two flights. One event of I would like to book a trip yields, quite naturally, two actual flights. So this is like this. And the third thing you see on this slide is you don't necessarily have to do one thing with the stream. We can at once roll in sending to the user this idea that they've picked it up. So this just bundles a few different ideas that we've started to see into a fairly concise bit of code. So, excuse me. Is that it? I think we're there. I think we're there. I think we've built the game. And the important thing here is it's all built out of some relatively simple pieces. We have logs. New events come in. We decide what to do with them on a case-by-case -case basis. We transform it with a function, and we send it on. Occasionally, we join it with other things to make new logs, richer, more interesting logs along the way. But it's all, nearly all, streams of events, facts, things that happened in the real world and why do we care? What do we do with it? How do we change it? So let's step back and think what we've built. It's a game, right? It's a game. And it, as a game, it looks like a toy. But it really isn't a toy. There's a lot going on here that um, has analogs in the real world. We have a real-time processing system. We have some sense that we could split this up into separate processing chunks. 
maybe on separate machines, maybe in separate microservices, which we can. If you imagine that instead of movement commands, we had the user move to this web page or this part of the application, then we've got analytics. Our movement commands in a game are really exactly how you process or begin to process analytics. You can start to roll up the user journey through your site or through your application and look at the data that way. We have inventory. That's a sneaky way of me discussing shopping baskets without doing yet another order processing example, because it behaves in exactly the same way. And with that, we have state. State for the user's application, state for what they're holding. And when you look at things like um, using items and the rules for ch changing one item into another, you start to see how you might build a workflow system just out of streams of data and functions that transform them. As well as that, we also have a complete history, which I think is really interesting. These are immutable logs, and we've got today's work done with them, and we've shipped the game. But now let's step back and take a look at our command stream. All those commands, every single command the user entered is still there. We're not deleting it. It's an append-only log. So we can go back and ask questions like, do people tend to type commands we don't support? Do people always type in get instead of pick up? And we can analyze that stream and improve the user experience by saying, let's make get an alias of pick up. Do people try to talk to characters in our game? If we do, that's demand for a new feature that we should probably be supporting. We can put a different hat on and look at the same data in a new way and gradually improve the system. And we can kind of do that independently. When we split up into separate log files and separate pieces of processing, we can start to worry about it for wearing separate hats, perhaps in different teams, perhaps in, certainly in different processes. Or we can smush it all together and just build one small hack. We're free. We have some architectural options. And it's all built from some very, I think, simple primitives, which, as I say, if you're used to Java 8 streams or functional programming, these primitives will seem, I hope, very familiar. Slightly different syntax, but the same ideas. Stuff happens, transform the stuff, tell the world there's new stuff. Um, not sure I should get into this, but. It also kind of reminds me of Prologue, which is that language everyone just did one semester of at university and then forgot about. But seeing the world as facts and conclusions from those facts, which in turn become new facts, I think there's a parallel there. So that's how a system is built in this slightly strange, slightly database, very listy, very stream transformy system called Kafka, which I hope gives you some ideas for hacking. But to finish, I'd like to just step back quickly and reflect on the bigger picture that's going on with this. There, it seems to me that a lot of programming, a lot of the history of programming, is dealing with one big question which is, how do we handle state? And there are two big ideas in how we handle state, one that was maybe a bit bigger 10 years ago, one that's maybe a bit bigger now. And it's the idea of managing state by splitting it into islands or by not really managing state at all, but just by thinking of transforming data. So for instance, if you look at Java and functional programming, that, that, sorry, if you look at object-oriented and functional programming, I don't want to pick on a single language here. If you look at OO and FP, the OO solution to dealing with state says, I will worry about my own state. I will keep it. I will manage it. You have state. You have state. And it's the programmer's job to worry about communicating between these little islands of state. I'm not going to judge whether that's good or bad, but it's a way of thinking about state and splitting into manageable pieces. Whereas the functional programming solution to this is to say, there is no state. There's just a series of facts, and facts cannot change. 
All you can do is use it to derive a new fact, and then another fact. And you just start building a system where facts come in, they transform, and eventually you get a fact that someone on the other side is interested in. We see the same divide in, not just in programming languages, but in DevOps, right? Two schools of DevOps. One feels like slightly old school. We will have a series of servers, and we will manage those servers, and we will nurture and care for them as separate islands of state, and we have to worry if they are communicated, if they have synchronized state, if they are set up the same way, if we can treat one as the same as the other or not. And then there's the other school which says, let's just write down a list of facts about what a server should be like and write some software that transforms the state of any machine based on those facts. And then we'll just let the computer worry about actually building up the state from facts and transformations. So you end up with specified architecture and a little bit of magic under the hood making all your machines the same. You see the same picture again, I think, in front-end programming, where you have jQuery looking at different bits of the page and manipulating the state of it. Or the first version of Angular was a bit like that, where I control different parts of state. And then along comes something like uh, React and Reflux, which is just there's a series of facts that the user has given us, a click, uh, keyboard press, uh, mouse movement, how would that change what we're doing right now? And someone else can wonder, worry about rendering that and making the browser look like our state. There is a whole, everywhere you look, or everywhere I look at least, there is this whole how do we manage state, what happens if we try managing it as facts, events, and transformations. Um, and that's really the reason I decided to work at Confluent, because I'm very interested in how this might play out in the database world, how the idea of facts and transformations plays out in the world of large, persistent data defining our systems. And I hope I've given you some ideas about how systems like that, how you even think about systems like that, how you might begin to build them. Um, and if not, I hope I've given you some ideas for a fun lunchtime hack. Thank you very much.